Hello, I wanted to show you something that I made recently, and it's this, the little plastic flame thing. Turn it on. We have this, we have this plastic flame filled with these lights, and the lights are going through a pattern that feels kind of natural, feels kind of predictable, and yet it's absolutely not predictable. And to get a better sense of what's going on, let's take this plastic part off. So here on the inside, we have a ring of 16 RGB LEDs. These LEDs in particular are NeoPixels, they're sold by Adafruit. So this thing will go on through this weird kind of undulating pattern basically forever. And what's driving this thing is noise. And to get a better sense of that, let me turn the lights back on. If we were to open this up, then we would find a battery, a switch here, and then also a small microcontroller. The one that's inside here is a Trinket Pro, also from Adafruit. And what's important to know about that is that it is this tiny little computer that can do all these cool things with lights without putting all of this information, but it also has only a tiny amount of storage. You can only get 28 kilobytes of storage on this thing. So to get an idea of like how small that is, this image of Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo for the original PlayStation is about 150 kilobytes. So I would need about six of these microcontrollers just to fit that entire image. On one, I might be able to just get the guy's head. But to drive the whole thing, we're going to need a really small algorithm that can fit onto this really small flash storage of this microcontroller. And fortunately for us, there's already one that's been around for decades now called Perlin Noise, created by Ken Perlin. And here's what that looks like. What you're looking at is kind of a gray blob. Um, but it's a really cool texture, it feels nice, it feels kind of natural, and we can make as much of this stuff as we want. We can zoom out, uh, we can zoom in, we can zoom back to the medium again, we can start moving in one direction, we can move in another direction, we can start animating it if we want to. There's just infinite amounts of this noise that we can make. So if we have the noise function, put in an X coordinate, put in a Y coordinate, put in a Z coordinate, and we get some value from zero to one. As an example, let's put in some numbers here. Boom, 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 and we get this. But one number on its own doesn't really do much for us. What we need is a whole grid of numbers. So we have a whole grid of X and Y coordinates that are then determining all these different noise values throughout the grid. What's important about these numbers is that they do have a range of numbers. It goes on high and low, but also each neighboring numbers, there's not too much of a jump. There's not too much of a difference. They're actually close to each other. There is a gradient moving from one spot to the next, which is what makes this nice noise to have. So to get the grayscale image that we had before, what we're going to do is we're going to take these numbers from zero to one, and we're going to assign those to values of brightness. Zero is black, absolutely no light. One is complete white, and all the other values in between are the different grayscales, and if we apply that to that grid, then we'll get this. We'll get all these numbers being replaced by all these different grayscale values, which again is nice. Like we said before, we can make as much of this stuff as we want, but what's gonna be fun for us to play with is in animation. And so the key thing for noise is if you want to animate in one dimension, you need to move through the next dimension. So we have this whole box of numbers and what was gonna happen is we're going to start moving in the Y dimension. And if we look at one row, say the middle row, we can see that each one is also animating. So we have this one dimensional line and it's being affected by two dimensional movement. You're probably getting a little bit bored of all this gray, so let's move on to some color, some hue. So to do that, we can look at the color wheel. So we have this, we have red at the top, and go around and come back to red. This is often associated with degrees, so red would be zero, going up 30, 60, 90, and all the way back around to zero again. But we can also map that to the zero to one if we wanted to. So zero could be red, and then actually one could also be red as well. It can all connect, it can all cycle through. So we can apply those different values to the different hues of the color wheel, and we get this for the animated grid, everything moving down. We then isolate the bar in the middle, and we can see the effect of one bar of that, so we can see the animation happening within one place. Um, let's now go back to the main view again, so we have the full 2D view. And instead of using one static range of colors for this, we can start by cycling through the range itself. So the range can constantly be moving around this color wheel as all these values are moving down this grid. So if we isolate the bar again, we get an even more interesting animation. So we're having all of this different movement through Perlin noise, and we're also having movement through the color wheel at the same time. But now for one last trick that we want to do here is to apply all of this noise to saturation. Saturation, if something is fully saturated, then it's like the bluest blue that it can be. If it's totally desaturated, there's no color at all. And in the middle would be kind of like sky blue, 
uh, maybe more like this shirt. So let's look at the animation for that. We have all these things moving down here again for saturation of just one color. We can isolate the bar and we have this. And that is the last trick, the last ingredient of what's going into the light combination, the final light combination. And if we add all those three things together, then we have this. Or we almost have this because this is a line of values and this is a circle. We could try and cheat our way out of it by just wrapping those values around a circle. The only problem with that is that humans are really good at pattern recognition. So even though most of the time you won't be able to see the seam of where the beginning and end meet, sometimes you will. And once you start to see the seam, you can't see anything but the seam. You're just gonna see the flaw right away. So we want to avoid that. To, and to avoid that, what we need to do is put all of these values into 2D space. So that's the next step. So back to animation, just like we needed to move in two dimensions in order to animate one dimension, we also need to move in the third dimension to animate two dimensions. To visualize what this looks like in 3D, we'll have a whole stack of 2D slices of noise. All of these are just in one long array in space, and as they move towards the front, and they hit the front, then a new frame will get stuck there, almost like splatted up against the front of it. And if we keep doing that again and again and again, which is really moving the front through that 3D space instead of those things moving forward, then we will start to have an animation happening. So if we move around towards the front of those stack of plates, everything moving into each other, then you can see how moving through 3D is creating animation within 2D. And now that we know how we're moving things through in 3D in order to animate 2D, we can put everything together in 2D. We have hue, saturation, and brightness all being animated at the same time in one grid. And that gives us all the colors we need to send to the LEDs. We have all of these things. They're existing in 2D space. It's being animated in 3D. And there you have it, an LED torch controlled by noise. All right, I know I didn't get into any of the actual code for this, but if you wanna learn how this all works with actual code, I highly recommend these videos on Perlin Noise by Daniel Schiffman over at Coding Train. Everything I know about Perlin Noise, I learned from watching these videos. So just give it a bit of time and it'll make a lot more sense. If you have access to a 3D printer and some electronics, then all the instructions for making this particular lamp are down below. If you wanna play around with the code to tweak the settings to make the effect more to what you want, there are three main things to play around with. That would be the speed, that would be the zoom, and that would be the range. Changing the speed is pretty self-explanatory. If you have it nice and slow, it would be more like a soothing effect. And if you have it fast, it would be much more turbulent effect, maybe more like a fireplace or something like that. Similarly, the zoom or the scale of it all is how big you want all of these noise pieces to be. If you're zoomed in, it will have big waves to it. And if you're zoomed out, then it will be much smaller, much more of a turbulent effect from far away. And as for the range, the range is the values of the noise that you want to focus on. So the values that you get from noise are not evenly distributed. It's not like an even like random thing happening. In fact, it's more of a bell curve. So if we look at this example of a grid we're going to be animating through it, then we also have a chart getting squeezed out over here. So knowing about the distribution of noise and knowing what that range is, you may want to expand the range so that it actually covers the full spread of values that you want to cover or you may want to use that to target more specifically an area that you want to influence. You don't want to have the full range of brightness, but you want to move that noise value that you're paying attention to, to just the area that you want to cover. Uh, and that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope that helped. I hope that made sense. I hope that at least you have a basic understanding of what noise is. You don't even know how, know how it works, but if you, again, there are plenty of other resources to dig into the mathematics behind it, like vectors and dot products and all that kind of information which is fun, but it will not affect anything that you're going to actually do with it using it as a tool. It's just a little bit more for some deeper understanding. Hmm. I hope that was helpful. If it was, uh, please like, please subscribe. Thanks for watching. And for now, here's a few other examples of things that can be done with noise.